So we're going to uh, pepper our panel with another small video of Jean Near. So if you're standing and talking, you might want to draw, have your attention drawn to the screen before we begin. There's, there's something about sheep. There's, there's been a misunderstanding and a feeling that sheep were dumb. Sheep are sheep, and they're, they act like sheep, and you really, it would be ridiculous if they acted like something else. <laughs> So we are going to now explore some of the, we call it the true cost, but I think instead of being focused on spreadsheets and metrics and bottom lines or triple bottom lines, we're focused on narrative. And the narrative is going to be brought to you today by those on the land. And so it's for your own distillation, your cognitive process to distill true cost. Because for each of us, you'll hear and you'll be able to listen. Today is so much about listening to those on the land. How much work goes into that which I'm wearing? How much work goes into taking care of these animals so that they even can be sheared? And so this um, graphic here, it's a little bit faint on the screen, but we have printouts of it and you can take a little true cost piece home. And this graphic was distilled again from these conversations I was having with people about what they were most concerned about and what um, they wanted to have discussion points ab uh, about with the general public. So what would be helpful for us as an audience of wearers, an audience of some of us producers, to hear from people who spend their day to day on the land with the sheep. So I will start by saying that I feel very blessed to have these very busy people who I can barely get a hold of on email, I have to say. I'll, it's very, text and email uh, exchanges over the last few months have brought us all together. Thank you. <laughs> and this is Robert Irwin from Chaos Sheep who sits um, right to my left. And he ha and Jamie are here with their daughter, I believe Claire. And they work in a contract grazing situation where they're bringing livestock into perennial and annual systems. They don't manage land that they own. They manage for other people's um, needs on landscapes that include vineyards and orchards. Um, and then Ryan Mahoney is here. And I'm, I've heard many amazing things about Ryan's work. And so I'm here learning, as you are today, about what he, um, what he does and how much heart and soul and tradition he brings to his work, and he will explain more. <laughs> and Carlene has also not only brought herself today, but she has brought that which can feed you. So Wire Rock Cheese, um, this is the woman behind the cheese. <laughs> and Erin Gilliam is here, who is a, also a contract grazer, who when I speak with him, we talk about bunch grasses and meadows and California coastal prairie. And I feel very enlivened and heartened to think about someone moving sheep across the landscape who has such care for the biology of this place. So we'll start, um, yes, thank you, Erin, um, by giving you each a couple of minutes to just describe the breed of sheep that you're raising and any of the operational focus that you're having. Even if it's very right now, what's up for you? Just let us know. We'd all like to hear. And I'll start with Robert. Oh, I thought I was last. You're first. <laughs> uh, totally would have switched spots with Erin. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm Robert Irwin with Chaos Sheep Outfit. Uh, I'm a third generation sheep uh, sheep rancher herder. Uh, 
<coughs> my wife and I, uh, Jamie, uh, Mrs. Boss, uh, run uh, currently about 4,000 breeding ewes. Uh, eventually, we'd like them to all be a Coredale type sheep, but uh, currently, that's only about 10 to 20 percent of our flock. The uh, majority of them are uh, fine wool Rambolets. Uh, we contract grays in Lake, Mendocino, Calusa, and Yolo County. Uh, we've just purchased a, 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 a operation uh, from a gentleman who is retiring. So we're kind of switching between, uh, we're s so the best way to describe our, our, uh, our company is have sheep will travel. Um, so economically, the way, way our, our operation works is we make the landowner money. Uh, we have figured out how to substitute sheep with tractors, uh, utilizing uh, sheep instead of human labor, um, and decreasing the, the our our customer. Uh, so our our byproduct is lamb wool and fiber, and our customers are landowners, uh, vineyard owners, orchard owners, pears, walnuts, alfalfa, tomatoes. Um, all the way down the list of other food products, and so our business is, our model is set up to make the landowner money <clears throat> while still f uh, paying us to bring our sheep in and provide uh, to, to provide a service. Uh, uh, I think that's about it. Thanks. So my name is Ryan Mahoney. I'm a fifth generation sheep rancher. Um, our ranch is actually located right next door to Dave Hamilton's ranch and I know Dave and the Hamiltons very well and that quote that uh, Dan gave you is very much Dave Hamilton. Um, uh, we uh, we raise, we, we, we are, our breeding ewes have been in the Montezuma Hills for since about 18, late 1870s is when my Great great grandfather settled there. Um, I was raised on the home ranch, where the ranch that he bought when they came over from um, Denmark, and the my, actually my great grandma came from Denmark, and my great grandfather came from the Netherlands, and they um, settled about a mile from each other. And when they were dating, this is just a good side story. I'm good on tangents, but when they were dating, my great grandfather ran a wire from the home ranch across the hills over to my great grandmother's house so they could talk to each other. <laughs> and it was pretty. <laughs> Pretty neat story. Um, anyway, so our ewes are basically, they're Rambouillet base. Um, there's a little dorset in them. There's, um, but then we also, um, we're kind of a, I guess you'd consider us a commercial operation. Um, we sell our wool into the commercial market. And um, lamb meat is the main byproduct that we're selling, or the main product that we're selling. The wool is a side note. And pretty much the reason it is is because uh, the lambs off of our ewes um, gross us back about 250 to 300 dollars per ewe, whereas the wool grosses us back about 10 dollars. And that's even with shearing a 20 to 21 micron, um, 10 pounds off of a ewe clip. So it's, it's still a pretty decent clip, but just the, the, the way the commercial market's set up, it's just not incredibly profitable to really drive for the wool. Um, so that, that's pretty much our, the, the breeding herd, our operation, fine fiber, would be that, that our main focus is quality. We want to make sure that we take care of our animals. Um, we, and by doing so, really, we want to take care of that land. We want that land to be able to be passed on to my kids and the, the future generations. And, and so we, have, we run cattle and sheep together. Um, we do incorporate some kind of farming in order to help balance the, 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 the systems of land that they're being raised on, so. Thank you. Uh, I'm Carlene Wyrock, and my husband and I have a small sheep dairy in uh, Sonoma County. We're moving from one ranch to another. We've been uh, leasing land. Um, since we started our company, we're, oh, I guess we're moving into our seventh year now with our license. So um, we raise primarily East Frisian, which is the highest producing uh, milk breed. It's a very large, docile sheep. The rams are well over 300 pounds. I've had a number of ewes that are at least 275 pounds. The vet always estimates, if we ever have to medicate anybody, he always estimates a ewe um, at least 200 pounds. So big animals. They do produce a lot of wool, but they, are, they have been bred, you know, for hundreds of 
years, oops, specifically for, um, for milk production. So that means that even though we do sell many of our lambs as meat animals, um, these, they, they, and they do, we, they do produce a lot of wool, they have a long, coarse, uh, staple length fiber, but um, I'm, I'm always struggling to figure out what to do with the wool and how to monetize that. And I haven't really made sense of that piece yet. So um, I guess that's why I'm here. I guess that's why I'm here. <coughs> so, um, yeah. No, Go please. No, no. Go ahead. Uh, the butterflies that they talk about have been migrating up my stomach and into my throat <laughs> and might choke me right now. <laughs> So I apologize. Uh, my name is Aaron Gilliam, and um, I have a dark secret, which is that I don't have wool sheep. I have hair sheep. <laughs> uh, so I'm slightly confused as to why I'm here. But I do work uh, with other people's sheep. I actually don't own a single sheep. Um, I manage other people's sheep around Petaluma, um, Marin County, Sonoma County, and my focus is on the soil's health. So, um, and the sheep's health, like uh, Ryan was saying. If you're focusing on the land's health, you're focusing on your animal's health as well. Um, and my clients, I haven't gotten into vineyards or orchards. They've been public and uh, private clients that are interested sometimes in not the soil. Fire is a big uh, contract grazing. Uh, focus and I try and be the little bird in their ear that says you can take care of your fire and the soil at the same time and because you can you can take care of a fire issue with a tractor or a mowing or sheep in a way that um, doesn't respect the soil's health and therefore everything that grows from it and you can do it in a way that is also helping the built the soil to build itself so that's that's kind of my focus thank you so we'll go to the first question, um, and thank you all for sharing. And Ryan, I, no, meeting you for the first time, I'm also a fifth generation of a watershed, and I feel very akin to your narrative. So just wanted to put that out there. Um, so I would love to hear about labor. When I interviewed all these people about their projects, a lot of what was talked about was um, labor as being a core issue. I wanted to hear from you about your day-to-day. -day. You could describe some of the activity and then where in that activity you, you have found yourself needing extra hands or, or if you do need extra hands or where the labor points are. Um, we're, we're really interested in that, especially now thinking about how we support more people, young people coming into this work. Um, we need to assess where the labor issues are if there are some. So we'll start with you. Uh, I would say uh, labor is probably our number one issue by far. Um, we're looking for people uh, that are uh, committed to the animals, uh, uh, committed to the animals. I guess that's the correct way where they'll put the animal in front of their own person, uh, whether they want to take a vacation or go out to the bar and have a drink. Um, those type of people are very hard to come by. Um, and, and are passionate about what they're doing. Uh, I, I think out of all the animals that are that are raised for, for anything, sheep are the ones that you have to do with passion. I think you can hate cows and be a dairyman or a, a cowboy, but I do not think you can hate sheep and raise sheep. Um, and so finding it, you're, so if you've got billions of people in the world, you're literally looking for a minute percentage of people that have that beating in their chest. In a day-to-day -day operation, uh, we have uh, 1,500 walking animals per guy, and uh, each we have our, our our rotational system is based off of uh, 500 animals per group on enough acre, on enough forage to last five days and move every five days. So uh, we we build fence, move the sheep, tear down the fence, build the fence for one group, and then we, so there's three days of that, and then two days of just kind of going through their systems and making sure water, checking the animals. Uh, we are uh, just kind of starting to build, I call it a culture, it might be the wrong word to use, of, of uh, non-competitive teamwork where we're all working together and uh, 
but setting a goal for the entire team. If somebody trips, the other guy picks him up and in, uh, in setting those, those, those in line where everybody's on the same page and all shooting for the same target. Um, but labor is, uh, we've had quite the turnover. We've had 36 employees uh, in 18 months and we only need five. Um, so uh, <clears throat> the commitment issue uh, to the animal is, is probably the, and the passion and the heart and the care and, and the drive, that those kind of things are, uh, they're a character, uh, they're inside the character and if you don't have them, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong, it's just finding those people are, are very difficult and usually the people that do have it, like Aaron, are doing something for themselves, they don't want to work for somebody else, so. Um, Plan B. <laughs> uh, so it's, the, it's just very difficult to find the right people. Yeah, I'd, I'd absolutely echo everything Robert said. I mean, labor is definitely our number one challenge, um, and it's and it's not so much the pay. I mean, are uh, are the people that work for me that make minimum that would make minimum wage? They're making thirteen to fifteen dollars an hour right now today, and as we have the minimum wage increase, their pay is going to increase. Um, there, there. That's just it's a huge challenge, and um, and when you get people to train them to realize that that. You know, these are living, breathing animals, and it's our job to give them the best, healthiest life possible. And if that means that you need to put in an extra half an hour, um, you have to do it. If it means that there's a there's a dog in the field at 12 o'clock at night, you get in your car, and I drive out, and I make sure that everything's okay. And I, if the car drives through the fence and breaks something, I'm out there fixing it, and they got to come out and help me too. And, and, and it's, it's hard to find people with that kind of commitment and the ability to put that first. Um, one, one other labor um, deal that, that I think is very, very, very costly to me, and I'm sure everybody can attest to that, is the cost of shearing and um, the ability to find quality shears. So there's two kind of things together. Um, right in the last five years, I've gone from about $2.50 a U to now I'm going to be approaching $5 just to the shear. Plus you have to pay for the bag, plus you have to pay wool check off, plus you have to pay commissions to any brokers that you're selling it through, plus you have to pay for your guys to bring them in, you have to work them, you have to push them out. All those things have costs and so when you add all that up, um, it, it's just becoming very, very difficult to 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 to, to make shearing affordable. I mean, you've had a big increase in the hair breeds in, in the sheep industry um, because of the ability to find shears. And then the ability to find quality shears is, is a serious, serious issue. Um, a lot of guys, you know, you, you can find some crews and they just go and, and get, get doped up on as much stuff that they can get on and just fly through as many as they can, but they do a really sloppy job. And other guys, they, they'll, they'll take their time and do a really good job, but they can only do 10 a day. Um, in our operation, we have about 5,000 breeding ewes, and so it takes us about a week to shear those. And so we need a crew of 5, 10, 12 people to come in and be able to get 70 to 100 head a day in order to get through them all. And so just the ability to find those good, and then you got then you got to handle the wool once it comes off. You have to have people that care about keeping the floor plant clean, care about sweeping out the tags and sorting the bellies, and and taking off if there's the top knots too tight or the leg wool's tight, making sure they're sorting that out of the fleece and then packing the fleece right. And I mean, it's it's a really a big challenge and and um, and, and just a huge cost um, going forward. And it, and it's like I said, it's not so much like a dollar per hour cost as much as it is the ability to find the person with that skill. So. Um, I. We actually do most of the work ourselves. Uh, we do um, hire uh, very occasionally some off-farm help. And um, I, I've, I've just sort of pulled back from looking for off-farm help and kind of called my flock down a bit. I am kind of in the process of looking at, well, I'm scaling up a bit and I've, I think I've hit, I know now where that line is on what I can do as the sole milker, as the primary shepherd, et cetera. Um, and that means last year I milked 66 animals in the beginning of the season that dropped down to 54. I mean, that's not many sheep, but these are dairy animals, right? So if you're milking, you're milking twice a day for at least half the year. Dairy sheep only give you milk five to six months max out of the year. And then the rest of the time, you know, you're doing other things. You're caring for them, you're hoof trimming, and you're doing all the other parts of the business, like selling product. and 
all that. Um, so I do, um, I, for example, right now I need help just trimming hooves because I like to trim everybody um, before, um, you know, I'll, I'll trim a couple times a year, ideally the whole flock, and then I'll trim on an as needed basis. But, um, you know, I need, I need skill for that. It's nice to bring somebody in that you can kind of train, but, um, you know, feet are really important, and these are working animals. You know, these aren't all meat animals, and I need my animals to live for eight to ten years. And so, um, hoof health is is pretty important. It's it's easy to screw up hoof trimming. So, I'm looking for that. Um, yeah, it's not always a question of money. I've when I have hired off um, help, you know, I've always paid. $15 an hour, and that was several years ago. And that inclu and included in that would be tips in cheese and tips in, you know, a lamb and, you know, whatever, whatever I have. And um, just because, you know, you just so appreciate when you can find somebody who has, <laughs> echoing what everybody else has said, you know, that, that kind of passion and that attention, um, you know, sheep don't always tell you right, what's going on with them. They're really good at disguising any ailment or sensitivity, and they're, you know, they can be shy. And I mean, I think that's an instinctual mechanism to keep them uh, safe. But, um, yeah, you just have to have that sheep eye. It's kind of like going mushrooming, you know, it takes a little while, and then you start seeing them. Um, we do hire somebody, um, the same guy has been coming out and shearing our sheep every year, and I pay a premium. I pay over $5 a sheep, and I tip on top of that. And I do that because I'm so grateful. And because these are working animals, you know, we have all these sensitive bits, and I have big, giant, bulbous udders and giant nipples and all that. So, I mean, that's really important that none of that gets nicked, right? So, um, yeah. So, and I'm happy to pay that cost, really. Um, if I can, my goal has always been if I can somehow recoup my shearing costs with my wool, then I'm winning. I'm never, I've never tried to actually make any money off the wool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, I have only had a year with um, contracted help and so I don't have much to say about employees yet, but um, I can say from my own experience and from employees' experience that it's, uh, it's like adventurous phys physical labor. And, and with adventure comes injuries, uh, both chronic and acute. And that's expensive. Um, you know, like I said, adventurous is fun. Um, dogs, I hopefully, are going to be my savior. I'm training my first dog right now, and she's already saving me a lot of s twisted ankles and mud in the face and all sorts of stuff. Um, so the the future dogs for me is going to equal uh, uh, better cost for for labor, uh, and then uh, the same the same attention to detail that you guys were talking about comes into play. I'd say th the same amount and then more. When you're considering a diverse ecology, uh, meadows and, and rangeland, one of the things that we try and do is be really considerate of uh, what's happening in each, in each paddock that we're going into. So I can't really set someone to say, <clears throat> here's a week, use 12 fences a day, move these sheep in, move them out. They need to be able to look at uh, what's seeding right now. Is that something that we would would like to let get to full maturity on the seed and then we'll knock it in? Uh, is there a bird habitat that's a ground nesting bird we need to, need to be considerate of? What's the soil moisture doing? Is that going to be compaction or is it going to be the right kind of uh, agitation and aeration for the soil? Um, how much uh, leaf litter are we laying down? Uh, is it too much? Is it going to be a, a thick thatch? that we're laying down, or, or are we not knocking it down enough? It's just going to stand there and oxidize and not feed the soil. So, And that's the part I really love, is being able to read the land, um, read my sheep, bring the two together, and and find a really good balance. But it's something I can't just, I can't just bang out. I bang my head a bunch, thinking about it way too much, 
and it'd be nice if I could go out there and whip it out, but um, consideration for all those factors takes time, and, and it does take people with, with knowledge, and you can train them. I, I'm really lucky to have grown up around here, so I feel like I know the various ecotones, like the back of my hand, as best as I can, uh, always learning, but having, having gotten to literally crawl through the sloughs and climb through all the trees and, and uh, spend my days outside has, it has to have given me a, a couple feet up in my ability to then manage those landscapes, which not everyone has, even if they're really interested and passionate about it. So uh, it adds another layer of, of requirement and certainly uh, reparation. Thank you. Thank you. On a positive note, because I like to be Mr. Optimist, I actually think that the labor issues and the the, the improve, like the minimum wage going up is going to make a huge opportunity for contract grazing as the cost of driving tractors and man hours goes way up. Uh, I'm my phone has been going crazy with uh, because people are can't afford if the cost of food doesn't rise with the cost of labor they won't be able to afford to do a lot of the things they're doing in the past and they're more open to new ideas. So a lot of our leaf picking stuff that we do in the vineyards it requires a lot of manual labor. Uh, we're already cheaper than, uh, we're not as consistent as manual labor, but we're cheaper per acre and you can come with fewer guys behind us. So there's a lot of opportunity as well with, with the higher labor costs on, on other people's property. If it, if, you know, the minim, minim, for the weed eating guys on steep facilities that are doing fire, fire prevention on steep, steep hillsides and they're using weed eaters, that cost is gonna go through the roof is, is, is man hour costs go up, unless you're using prisoners, correct. <laughs> but, uh, but sheep then can, we can then compete. You're putting us, you're putting livestock in a, in a, in a, in a marketable situation against, uh, with competition on, on manual labor for, for lots of different things. Thank you. So the next question is about predation and I just wanted to hear over time, you know, some of you have more experience in certain ecotones, as Aaron says, than others, but if you have any historical reference point for how predation has affected and, and what it is like now, that might be of interest as well to us, because we had heard from Dan that um, there's an expectation that the predators will increase in size in the next 10 years, and uh, I know that, I think it was in 74 when they banned poisoning coyotes in California, I believe. Was that around that time? I was born in 84, I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> he was born in 84, he says, he has no idea. Okay. But um, <laughs> as far as I recall, um, it was like mid-70s um, when we did something that, I mean, ethically it was, um, you know, an important move. And so what is the transfer of responsibility now to the eyes, hands, ears, dogs, now that we're not using, you know, synthetic compounds or other things. So I'm just curious to hear from you what it's been like and any updates on predation and the cost of that to your flock. Uh, dogs, we use, uh, we use, we have, currently we have 32 great, or white, we call them white dogs. Uh, we have mixed breeds. We are unspecies specific. Um, our dogs are, well, they're, they're like our best friends. You'd think with that many dogs that they wouldn't have names, but they all have names. And uh, we have a system be, uh, where each one of the dogs makes it to the vet twice a year. Uh, they're all on every, everybody's well taken care of. Uh, we have, uh, because we care about our, uh, I mean, uh, dogs are super expensive. I don't think anybody understands quite how expensive a guard dog is or livestock protection dog. Um, but to our company and what we're doing, it, they're almost our lifeblood. The, uh, Jill's completely right. Our sheep, they literally, the dogs lead, they're the first ones on the truck when we're loading them on the trucks. They run up to shoot and they're, they're, they can't wait to go pee on something new. And uh, then when we're going to a different field, the dogs lead the way. Um, and the, it's, it's really crazy to, because we grew, I grew up in an area where guard dogs weren't used at all. I remember I was 20, 26, 27 when we got our first livestock protection dog and a light came on. I do, like this thing, he works 24 hours a day, seven days a week, never like talk about labor issues. He just committed completely. He, li like, he, he literally is committed. 
hundred, hundred, you know, 365 days a year. Uh, so with that kind of commitment, we go way kind of overboard on, on, our, on the care for our dogs. But we figure we're probably spending $1,300 a month just in dog food. And uh, each dog's probably like cost vet, wormer, all, the, all in, we're probably in $4,500 a dog. And so if you put that dollar amount on a sheep, I mean, let's just say for easy math, $200 a sheep, they've got to save a pile of sheep every year to pay for themselves. Uh, you put me in the spotlight, I can't do mental math. Uh, our biggest issue isn't with coyotes, cats. I don't mind losing a sheep now and again to a coyote or a cat or a bear because they're making a living. They're, they're just like me. We're out on the same land doing the same thing, making a living. Uh, what breaks my heart and probably breaks every person's heart that raises sheep is domestic dogs. And uh, my guard dogs don't work against domestic dogs. The, when you have the confrontation, if you sit and watch, you'll learn more watching sheep than you'll, you, you will watching television for sure. Um, but the dog, a domestic dog will come in and he'll go through the fence, somehow get in with the sheep. He'll usually, the white dogs will run up to him as an aggressor and then the domestic dog will roll over onto his back as a belly nine times out of 10. The dog will be the dom, my white dog will be the dominant dog and then he'll stand up, move away and then the domestic dog will get up and go kill a sheep. And I've seen that happen twice. And then you grab domestic fufu and you take him over and say, hey, your dog just killed a sheep and then you have to go through that. And my dad had a policy when I was a kid that you shot, shoot, shovel and shut up. <laughs> and uh, the three S's and I, we didn't know, our neighbors hated us. Uh, and so as me growing up kind of noticing that and people just don't even talk to you when you're in the grocery store because Fufu got killed. Uh, we bring Fufu over, we tell them what happened. If it happens again, you know, we have to protect our animals. So we, we try, we haven't, and si since that relationship has kind of started with our neighbors and we kind of have a proactive way about doing it. We go to every neighbor's house where we're bringing sheep in. We give them our phone number, our name, everything. Please keep your dogs on a leash. Please take, you know, we'll do our best. If there's a problem on either end, here's our phone number. Uh, funny note, side note, uh, when one of the vineyards was doing a marketing, uh, trying to figure out who's buying their wine, 70% of the people that were buying their wine were women. And out of those 70%, when they were asked about the quality of the water uh, on, the, on the vineyard, the quality of the air quality, the soil quality, or the quality of life of the dogs on the vineyard, 70% of that 70% want to know about the dog. And so <clears throat> each one of our vineyards has a file on, uh, like has it on staff, and we probably get most of the calls due to the dogs. Uh, most of the fields that we're grazing on alfalfa were due to the, the farmer's wives wanted the white dogs in front of their place. Um, so there's, but it, they're personalities, they're like people, they're, they're employees. So like right now we have Sabaka and because we're lambing and we have little groups of sheep kind of spread out all over the place, you have to have uh, fewer numbers of twins in a field than you would if they were singles. And so Sabaka's in a field by herself and she's depressed and she quit eating. And so we literally have to manage her personality in our system. So we have to get Sabaka, her buddy, back. And uh, we're kind of short dogs right now because one of our females just had a litter of puppies. So what are we? one group's going to have to go without a dog to make Sabaka eat her dog food. So um, it's just kind of, you don't realize it until there's this whole system, but it's all, the sheep's got, the, they get along like Hank has to go with his sheep. You cannot move Hank from one group of sheep to another. Where Brutus doesn't care, as long as there's dog food, he'll guard anything. So it's all the personalities and then you kind of mesh all that. But I mean, we have five person employees, but if you add in the border collies and everything else, we've got 50 employees and we've got to take care of them. And we have a, we're running out of time on this, and I do want to handle a question or two. So just letting everyone know on the panel. <laughs> so what was the question again? Yeah, <laughs> that was an awesome answer, Robert. Um, it was all good. of the time was warranted. Uh, it was about predation. Just the cost of predation. Yeah. So, so we're very fortunate where we're at. Um, we're in Solano County in the Montezuma Hills, pretty much underneath the wind farm. If you've ever been out there. And um, because we don't have a lot of trees, uh, we don't have mountain lions, we don't have bears, we don't have those. We do have uh, coyotes and domestic dogs are our main, main predators. Um, we don't run any dogs. Um, we also have irrigated pasture that we run up in, um, up towards Dixon Davis area. 
And um, because of our proximity to the amount of cyclists we get over there, we don't run the guard dogs where we're at. We just really work on our fences very well because we just we're so fearful of having a confrontation with a, a guard dog on, on a cyclist or a guard dog on somebody um, that we just we're the liability is, is tremendous for us. Um, in an application like Roberts, where he's at, I don't see how he could survive without guard dogs. Um, and I think that's probably true for most operations in, in California and probably probably the United States. Um, the domestic dog issue is absolutely the most devastating one. Um, the coyotes, they kind of, they, they, they work on you all year round. They take one here, one here, one here. It's kind of like um, the good Lord's tithing. You're just paying your dues um, to, to, to mother nature on that. But with the domestic dogs, when they come in, they come in, they come in, it's usually a short amount of time and they do a tremendous amount of damage. Um, I just got a call this morning coming in. We had a domestic dog get in um, our sheep last night. And this morning we found um, 15 um, dead chewed up lambs um, because of that. And when we get something like that, we, we identified the dog, we notified the neighbor and we, we brought the dog back to the neighbor. Um, just like Rob said, you used to have the policy of just you know, you have to just take care of the dog and don't say anything. But in today's world, um, it just doesn't work. I mean, that's not appropriate for the dog. It's not appropriate for the owner because if the owner gets another dog and doesn't take care of it, the same thing will happen in a year. So we go and we take the dog back to the owner. We tell them exactly what happened. And um, actually, 90% of the times, they actually do lock up their dog. Um, usually, we don't ask for it. We just, I mean, it's such an emotional guilt on their side a lot of times that, I mean, it just, you know, I would hope that just what they did, I don't want to hit them twice and ask for money. Um, I mean, it is expensive. I mean, that, that, it certainly is expensive and a big cost, but um, but like I said, it, 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 it's, uh, if it happens more than once, then yeah, we will ask for compensation. But, and if it's a big, big, big problem where we, where we lose a big bunch, um, we had a, yeah. Hey, I got a lot of terrible stories. Um, <laughs> maybe I should get some white dogs. Um, but <laughs> but um, I got a lot of good stories too. But anyway, it is just a big cost, and we, we constantly are dealing with it. And we try to, our philosophy is fences. We're all on um, leased or own ground that we've leased for a very long time or ground that we own. And so we're able to put the infrastructure up. We have 32 inch sheet mesh fence that goes down to the ground that keeps the, that allows the rabbits to jump through, but doesn't allow the coyotes to go through. And so we try to run that. And that's kind of our, that and working with the USDA wildlife services, um, when you have a problem, um, tends to be the best method of approach for our situation, so. Yeah, thank you, Carlene. So over the years, thankfully, we haven't lost too many sheep, um, but the ones that we have lost, we have lost to coyotes. And I, I actually, I attribute that mostly to ship, a shepherd's error. And um, <clears throat> uh, depending on the piece of property, we have uh, have depended on electric net fencing and we find that works really well, assuming you actually have clipped all of the corners and you actually have it turned on and, you know, it's not grounding out. And so, I mean, if that's all functioning and, you know, then you, either keep your sheep in that all the time and you move it around or like I tend to do, I tend to open them up to the main pastures during the day and then they all get are shepherded back in at night and they're given a feed treat and it's no problem bringing them in. Um, where I have lost animals typically, and these are smaller pieces of properties than I think than what they're running their animals on. Um, the last place we were on, it was 60 acres total with about, mm, I don't know, you know, one pasture was 10 acres, another one was 15, et cetera. So they were fenced, but like more cattle fencing. So anything could really get out and anything could come in. I'm not ever really worried about sheep running away. Dairy sheep in particular, they're so socialized to us and they're all about food and, you know, just being pampered. They're, they're not typically gonna run off. Um, it's always uh, a concern for us. Um, coyotes and domestic dogs. And uh, again, to echo what they're saying, domestic dogs for us is my primary concern and coyotes um, number two to that. Um, right now, um, we do, you know, every year we have about 120 lambs and I've been raising that on a kind of a more 
wild piece of property across the street from where we're currently at. It does have some pretty good fencing, but it is that's where all the wildlife comes off of Sonoma Mountain. You know, we have mountain lions up there, and we have coyotes and all kinds of critters. So. Um, up there, I am really diligent. I do keep them in a more of a confined area at night, and again, I let them out during the day. This is all really permanent, super fancy fencing, you know. Um, but I do have a guard llama there, and we do have great Pyrenees um, with my dairy flock across the street, which is a smaller parcel of about 11 acres. And again, that is really good fencing. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm not an expert with dogs. This is my first year with dogs like him, and I'm, this puppy is now seven months old. I've raised him since he was six weeks old, and I am being schooled by the other more experienced um, guardian dog people, and you know, hopefully we're doing the right thing. He's, it's amazing the instincts of these livestock garden, guardian dogs, and yes, very expensive to feed, um, but I think well worth it, and um, yeah, you know, it's so much is about. Oh, well, I just want to say, you know, when it's when I f when we have lost animals and you know I feel like it's shepherd's error. Usually, what that means is I have gone out to dinner with my husband, or we, you know, you leave the property and do something social, and you come back just after da dusk, right? Just you know, it's always then. And sure enough, you know, and you bring everybody in and you don't notice because the fields are like this and you, you know, you come out in the morning and you just feel like, oh, I'm missing somebody or you notice some um, birds circling, you know, and so it's usually the next morning you find that some animal has been dragged, you know, down. Terrible. Um, yeah, so that's, that's what we try and do. It's just so much is about being mindful and being there and never really getting to leave. Don't ever get to leave. So, yeah. so, so real, yeah. real quick, yeah. one thing I didn't mm. mention or uh, hear mentioned was um, something called a fox light. And uh, I've seen them, I haven't actually used them. I am the fox light. I often sleep out with the sheep when we're on contract and when I hear them rustling or I hear the coyotes getting close, I get out of the tent with a light and I'm, I'm <laughs> shaking around and whatnot. And, I really can't expect other people to do that, but they actually invented something called a fox light that does that for you. Um, <laughs> and there's people who have uh, irrigation time to motion centers, and uh, but a fox light sits on a T post or a tree post and shoots off random lights and different colors and patterns. And uh, for a predator, it, it lets them know that there's something going down there, and it's not just a motion sensor. Um, it seems random enough to have human activity associated with it. Uh, it'd it be has really a strobe feature. Yeah, it'd be really interesting to hear uh, from people who have used that, if it works well and at what scale and how far away it works and whatnot. The human strobe is effective. Uh, and then once again, fencing. I rely on fencing, I don't have guard dogs. But uh, that fencing, anything can get under it or go over it eventually, including the sheep. Um, it's a mental barrier. It's a flimsy nothing, if you haven't seen it. It's, it's quite flimsy looking. It's a mental barrier, so if your sheep aren't trained to it, they won't respect it. And if the predators aren't trained to it, they won't respect it. And it seems that there's a, if you leave your fencing, and if your paddock is big enough and it's, the fencing is there for a couple of weeks to a month, and that's how you've set it up, predators will learn that it's not that big of a deal. They will find the weak points and they will go through over and under it. Um, so. If you keep them constantly having to recalculate, they never get comfortable enough to go through it or, or test it that much. And they'll test it and they'll get zapped. But even that, after time, if they're hungry enough, they'll, they'll find a weak point. So one of the, the things that helps me is that I, I move those animals super frequently, um, once a day, sometimes more than once a day, and, um, but never longer than a week, really. Uh, mm. And it's, it seems to work. I have one more thing yeah, say. please. If you're not Sorry, already I know getting you're a out sense of, of I know you're cost. out of time, but um, oh, we spent a lot of time talking about coyotes and and um, and domestic dogs. But over the last I don't know how many years, but um, we 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 lose lambs to crows, um, <coughs> eagles, ravens, um, mountain the mountain lion issue. We haven't had any of that. Mountain lions wild are a problem. Pigs. Wild pigs, um, they can take down your fences and push things out on the highways. Um, the Two-legged, two-legged coyotes, um, often referred referred to as humans, 
they'll come and steal your sheep at times. Um, and then uh, I said eagles ravens. and ravens. We had a vulture in the lab. I mean, uh, during the high point in the drought, we had vultures. We've had, we've, had, um, we've had raccoons actually at lambing time take down the really little ones. Foxes sometimes, but usually they stay away. Um, and then uh, we've even had a couple of occasions where skunks uh, have taken them down. So, yeah, when they're just brand newborn, when they're little little lambs. And so the the, the breadth of predators are very large. Um, so I, I don't want to just, you know, let everybody know that it's just dogs and coyotes. There is a lot of things that eat sheep. So We need to develop a wool cow. Wool cows. Find a sheep shear than the shear a cow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That sounds like a biotech. <laughs> Maybe we can classically breed for that um, without genetic engineering. I was just, I, I saw that we, we have time for, I think, one question. Um, so I'll take your question in the back. A statement, okay. Okay. Thank you. So for those of you, yeah, round of applause for that. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure that the people who are live streaming in heard that um, a union plumber just made a comment about paying people $105 an hour, but still coming up against the same labor issues around um, caring for the work that you are taking part in and making sure that you have passion and heart behind everything you do. And I think that um, that is, uh, actually a beautiful theme for us as we think about all of uh, the ancestors, uh, the, you know, a living ancestor like Jean Near or um, the CWGA folks, how much it took. I just found out that I'm a third generation um, from a Mormon shepherdess family, shepherd and shepherdess family that was living in southern Utah raising sheep. And I found out about this some time ago reading my great great grandmother's diary and I was just thinking about how um, much work it got to, for people to, to cross the plains. And, and yeah, really atro atrocious things happened, and I used to focus more on that. But I'm just thinking about still the care that has gone into so much of us even being able to be here. Um, for better or worse, we are here. And I think um, there's a lot of beautiful um, essence in what you're saying about coming to this place of, like, let's all be paying attention to each other now and to the animals and the plants and renativizing ourselves to where we live and taking a deeper breath with all those we spend time with. So thank you, it was beautifully said. <laughs> um, I think that for now, because of our timing, I am gonna have to move to the next panel, which is thematically moving us into the skin. So what you've been hearing today, again, how we tend to do these panels is we move from the soil to the skin so that you understand the, really the whole piece of truth behind that, which like I say, no one would be here comfortably without their clothing. Um, I think it's a reality that we all face daily. Um, you're not gonna go anywhere without them. And so this is the reality behind creating biosphere-based fibers. This is what it means not to extract fossil carbon and make 
polyester and nylon. This is the reality behind the natural fiber system. So I hope that these stories have helped you distill that sense of true cost without having to look at a spreadsheet. So when you think about your sweater, you're thinking about a person and you're thinking about their story. So I, I deeply appreciate the intricacy of what you've shared with us today and thank you for your time. <laughs> some uh, dairy sheep wool. It's in the grease if anybody just wants to see it, if you're curious. And um, I do actually have some numbers on true cost because that's, because I am a business and I actually do keep track of that sort of thing. So if anybody is really curious on what it costs me to raise dairy sheep, I can give you some numbers. All right. Thank you, Carlene. Yay. And have some of her cheese. Make sure you taste the cheese. And Bellwether, uh, and also Marsha Baranaga. So Marsha and Carlene are both in the producer program, and their cheese is delicious. <laughs> <laughs>